There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. to mountains that I can't climb. Oh, you are with me, never leave me, because there ain't nothing, there ain't about family how it's going so fast well I wake up one morning just wishing that I could go back I've been thinking about lately maybe I can make a change and let you change me so with all of my heart this is my prayer singing oh Lord keep me moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me. Singing, oh Lord, show me what matters. Throw away what I'm chasing after. Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me. Keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment. Keep me in the moment Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me When I wake up in the morning Lord, search my heart Don't let me stray I just want to stay where you are Cause all I got is one shot One try We go around in this beautiful life Nothing is wasted when everything's placed in your hands. Singing, oh Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. Cause I don't wanna miss what you have for me. What you have for me. Singing, oh Lord, show me what matters. Throw away what I'm chasing after. 
Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me What you have for me Keep me in the moment Keep me in the moment Oh, keep me in the moment Keep me in the moment Keep me in the moment Cause I don't want to miss what you have for me What you have for me I'm thinking about heaven And the promise you hold So it's all eyes on you Till the day you call me home Singing, oh Lord, keep me in the moment Help me live with my eyes wide open Cause I don't want to miss These have been challenging times But the body of Christ has proven itself resilient We've gathered in different ways In different places yet stood steadfast as the church. We have found peace in God's promise to never leave us or forsake us. In our separation, we have remained united. In our struggle, we have lived out our faith. In the midst of the unknown, we have leaned on the strength of an all-knowing God. Throughout history, the church has thrived in adversity, and this moment is no different. The power of God is unstoppable, His love unending, His grace unrelenting, His glory undeniable. Today, no matter where we gather, we remain God's people. Our mission has not changed, our calling has not been altered. And nothing, absolutely nothing, will ever change that. We are the church, and today we stand resilient.
Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship. We're so glad that you are with us this morning, and we hope you sense God's peace and presence and grace as we worship together. For our Mariners folks, we want to let you know that even though we're not having Vacation Bible School here at the church building this week, there is an opportunity for you to have Vacation Bible School. Uh, Rocky Railway is coming, and this afternoon between 2 and 4, this afternoon here at the church, is the last time to pick up the at-home kits that families can use to look at Rocky Railway, Jesus Pulls Us Through. So please come and pick them up. There will be tables right outside the doorway to the church where you can just pick those packets up. So thanks for paying attention to that. Also, during today's service, at the conclusion of the message, Pastor Woody is going to be leading us through communion. So if you are home and have elements, uh, some juice perhaps, or any beverage, or some bread, or any food, uh, you might want to have them available. And if you don't have those available or would choose not to participate, that's fine as well. And if you don't have food or drink, you can take a spiritual communion this morning as Pastor Woody will lead us through that in just a moment. So at this time, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lead us, Lord. Lead us in your righteousness. Make your way plain before us in these times that are still so full of challenge, and yet we know that you are with us and we are grateful. So lead us into new ways, new ways of seeing things, new ways of doing things, again as you lead us, new ways of standing, sitting, jumping up or simply kneeling down, stooping down to help others for you and with you. O oh God, for those who are bending this morning beneath burdens that seem too large to bear, for any and all who are serving in harm's way and need your courage, for sick, for those who are weak, for those who may be dying, for those who are making decisions of great moment in these times, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. For the ability to, to break through the status quo toward your promised future in our lives and beyond, we humbly pray to you today. O oh Lord, may we be those who help the slow of heart to move. May we be those this morning and this week who by some clear winning word of love teach us and others the wayward feet to stay and guide us all in your homeward way. May your posture, Lord Jesus, be mirrored in ours. We ask it all in your name and for your sake, remembering how you taught us to pray, O Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And now let's sing together that great gospel hymn, Rescue the Perishing. Jesus, the mighty. 
from the Passion Translation says, in this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. There is a shaking that hearts away
Okay, all you children and all of those who are young at heart, we have the great privilege of having Miss Jill with us today, and she's going to tell us about some great things about the goodness of God's creation. Well, good morning, kids. So good to have you with us this morning. This morning, our Bible verse and our lesson comes from the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And it's from the first chapter. We are talking about how God created this amazing world that we live in. God loved us so much that he created this amazing world that has so many beautiful creatures in it. Look at this picture here. Wow, can you look at this amazing creation? God created all these different animals. He created ducks that swim in the water and fish and birds. He created little bunnies and big deer, huge mountains, beautiful trees. Look at all the different variety of animals that we have and the different varieties of green and just landscape. It's amazing. He created everything and he said, it's good. It's not just good. It's very, very good. God is an amazing God and loves us so much that he just created this environment for us that has so much beauty, so much goodness. So let me show you, too, some more pictures. Look at how God created a variety. You know, you know what that means. It means a lot of different things that are the same but different in some special way. So we can look at these pictures, and you can see that he created, look at all these kitty cats. Some are orange, some are black, some are miss a whole bunch of different colors all together. These beautiful parrots, they're all parrots, but they're different colors. These dogs, they're all Labradors, but there's a brown one, a black one, a yellow one, but they're all dogs, they're all Labradors, but there's a great variety. Butterflies, lots of different colors, lots of different types. They're all butterflies. It's pretty amazing. Horses and people. We all come in different sizes, different shapes, different ages, different colors. And God said, it is all good. It's all very, very good. So when you see lots of beautiful variety and you see the world that God's made, we just need to say thank you, God, for making us this beautiful world that has so much beauty, so many different types of things and, and people and variety. And it's, it's something that he said is good, is very, very good. Love it, take care of it, love each other. So, sounds great, kids. Have a great week. Love you. Hello, my name is Reverend Alex Sloan. For those of you who know me, you might not recognize me because I don't have my shirt and tie and coat on, but it's really me. In this day and age of, of social separation, we have to be careful of how we uh, treat one another and how, we, how close we get to one another. So this is the way that the church has decided to uh, do the scripture readings, or at least for the time being. The scripture reading for this morning is from Mark 10, verses 35 to 45 of the New International Version of the Bible. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want for me to do? Jesus asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right and the other in your left, in your glory. You don't know what you're asking for, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to, to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you through the lens. Uh, we miss you uh, a great deal. Um, I, I did want to set up the next hymn that we're doing, Oh Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. The first verse gets a lot of attention, as first verses usually do. But I think it's the last one that stands out to me. And, um, you know, it's definitely a stanza about hope, which um, I'll just speak for myself. Uh, I've been struggling with recently. Um, with everything that's been going on with uh, COVID, with school, lots of questions, lots of things up in the air. But take solace in the last verse. In hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's broadening way, in peace that only thou canst give, with thee, O Master, let me live. We're not alone. We're certainly not alone uh, with him, and we're not alone with each other, even though we may be apart. So let's sing, O Master, let me walk with thee. I remember when I was eight years old, my brother had invited me to join him in a long distance race. We had gotten to the place where the race was going to begin and we were getting our instruction. There were trophies that were going to be handed out for first place and a lot of other prizes that were available for different parts of the race. And I remember when we were getting our last minute instructions, my brother and I were standing there, there were these two guys that had looked at the winning trophy. And they declared, we're going to win this trophy. We're going to be number one. And then we lined up, the gun sounded, and the race began. Those two guys that had declared they were going to be the winners, they stayed right on the course, right on the path that we were supposed to be on until the judges were out of sight. And then they began to cut across any public access. They went across private lawns. They cut across parking lots anywhere that they could to cut the race down where they would be way ahead of anybody else. And when the race was over, sure enough, they won. They declared, we told you we were going to win. They took the trophy and they left. That was a different thing for me to hear, something entirely different than I had been thinking about or being taught about in church when I was growing up in St. John's. That dynamic shift of win at any cost didn't really fit with the spiritual posture that I was learning about in Sunday school that they were teaching me about in MYF, the Methodist Youth Fellowship. It was certainly not what I had been learning at VBS. You see, what I had been learning was that it's not bad to have a great aspiration. It's not bad to have a great drive and want to achieve everything in your life. But the end doesn't justify the means. It's not just about being first and winning, but it's how you get there. I want to take you on a journey today, and I want us to learn together 
of what kind of posture it takes to live a life of greatness, bringing others along with you, but not at their expense. In today's scripture, James and John approach Jesus wanting a spot in greatness and glory. Now, I need to set the stage for you because right before that conversation about the seating order that they were asking for was this other conversation where the Jesus was sharing with them that he was about to be killed. He was going to die on their behalf. Have you ever opened your mouth and asserted your own foot? I think that this scripture is where that phrase just may have come from. Jesus was saying, I'm about to be handed over to the likes of sinful men, and I'm going to suffer a vile and a cruel death on a cross. So you see our last moments here? They're cherished moments. Oh, wow. Wow, Jesus. Thanks for sharing. Hey, before you go, can you do something for us? Ouch. I kind of think that they missed the moment. But this moment isn't just isolated to James and John. If you had God's undivided attention, what would you ask for? When we have God's ear, we often are asking and more interested in what God can do for us than what God has to say to us. Let one of us sit at your right hand and one at your left they asked him. But then they were asked an even more serious question by Jesus. He said, can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And I believe that before Jesus even finished that question, before the words even got out of his mouth, both of them were saying, oh yes, yes we can. Sure, we can do that. Are you sure? Have you ever answered anything and had your mouth engaged way before your brain has? I've been there too many times. Jesus explained this. He said, the cup that I drink has a cross in it. It has a vicious death in it. Is that the cup that you want? Is that the future that you want? How many of us endanger our future because we want what we want in the here? And now, if we are going to live a life of greatness and step into who God created us to be, then we must have a posture of humility. Our greatness should never be at the cost of someone else, but in favor of someone else. You see, Jesus' last act before he left the earth was to take the towel and wash the nasty, dirty feet of the friends in the room with him. You see, God gave us a front row seat of what humility looks like. Nobody sees the soles of your feet. But you see, Jesus was saying, I do. Jesus says, I see everything. Not only do I see the nasty, dirty, disgusting parts of your life, but I will wash them clean. There is no job too awful for me. There is no assignment too low for me. There is no task that is beneath me. There is no person to vow for me. There is no life dirt beyond my washing. There is no soul beyond my cleansing blood. What are the things that God has asked you to do? And what are the situations that God has called you to? Whose feet have you passed by saying, well, I don't have time for that. That's not in my job description. You see, whenever we come to Jesus, he's never standing on top of a pedestal saying, I'm above all that. He's always on his knees in a posture of humility. If we are going to live a life of greatness and step into who God created us to be, then we must have a posture to serve. If God himself was not too busy to take on the posture of service, then we have no excuse that is worth hearing. There is something so transforming that happens when we serve. A posture to serve says, I am going to give to you on God's behalf, and I do not want anything in return. Well, it was after I left my formative years at 
St. John's, and I went to Trinity, that I saw a picture of posture of service. I saw what it looked like for that to be lived out every day in a man named Reverend Howard Gordy. Pastor Gordy invited me to come play softball here during a confusing crisis in my life. That invitation led to a mentoring relationship that lasted for over 30 years. Reverend Gordy served in so many areas and simply invited others along by his side. Nothing was beneath him. He helped park cars. I watched him help clean the church. I watched him serve in the kitchen. I watched him continue to cook in the kitchen. I watched him set up for services and events. I watched him take down after the services and events. I watched him pull the weeds outside the church. I watched him water the plants inside the church. I even saw him water the plants and care for the landscaping outside the church. And when our mission at one point in time was to go and begin building a habitat house, when we arrived, guess who was already there, shovel in hand, digging the footer? He modeled that there was no place too low. There was no job too big. There was no job too small. There was no person out of reach. He was a man of humble service. If we are going to live a life of greatness, and step into who God created us to be, then we must have a posture to love. Listen to verse 41. When they heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus said to them, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. You see, in our spiritual posture, We must reshape what it looks like to be a person with power and influence. Jesus is saying to his disciples, we are creating a new way. When everyone else lords their power and authority over them, not so with you. What I want you to do is unleash my power and love into the lives of those people. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. If anyone had the right to take the position of being served, it would have been Jesus. But he didn't do that. He turned that position upside down and he took on the posture of humility, serving in love. You see, the path of greatness is never found at the top. It's always found at the bottom. I remember my freshman year in high school. We were in a playoff game that would propel us on into a possible championship. I was on the mound. It was the last inning. There were two outs. There was a man on second and a man on third. The mound visit from my coach went like this. He said, listen, everything is going really well. We're almost there. We don't need any heroics at this point. We just need a strikeout. We just need a fly out. We just need a ground out. He patted me on the shoulder. He said, come on, let's get this done and win for the team. As he was walking back to the dugout, I was thinking, we don't need any heroics, but I've got a good pickoff move. I have a great pickoff move. So I decided to defy the coach, and I used my fantastic pickoff move. But this time, it wasn't so fantastic. See, I threw it toward third base, but it went completely over the third baseman's head, and it hit the top of the fence, and it careened all the way down. Two runs scored, and we lost the game. In that moment, I sank to my knees on the mound in defeat, in humiliation, in isolation. Everyone left me except my teammate, John. John was a senior. 
In that moment, John was an illustration of the posture to love. When everyone else had just watched what happened and they judged me and they left, you see, John understood something different. He understood that we never stand in a place and we never watch and we judge. But what we do is we actually run to and we love. You see, from our posture of love, we create a bond with another person and they feel that they matter. They feel that they are worthy. They feel that someone cares about them. You see, when we send out meals from Feed My Sheep, when we repair homes through helping hands, when we fill trailers with the food drive, when we provide transportation through the bike ministry, when we have the backpack initiative, when we bring presents for the angel tree, it's never about the food. It is never about the new roof. It's never about the canned goods. It's never about the bike. It's never about the gifts. It's always about the person. If we are going to live a life of greatness and step into who God created us to be, then we must raise our hand when no one else does. We must show up when no one else does. We must step up when everyone else steps back. Through the posture of Jesus, we are declaring that there is no task too big or too small. There is no place too far. There is no call beneath me. There is no person that does not matter. We put on the towel. We get on our knees and we wash and we wash and we wash because that is where abundant life is shared. That is where elevating hope is unleashed. That is where unconditional love is spoken. And Jesus shares the final posture with us today in the Gospel of Luke chapter 14. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and he had invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses why they couldn't come. The servant came back and he told his master. The owner of the house became very angry and ordered his servant to go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, bring in the crippled, bring in the blind, bring in the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Those four words should be the motivation of our hearts. There is still room. If you want to know what wrestles in God's heart and soul and causes him pain, is that there is still empty places because there's still room in his house. You see, our empty parking spaces should keep us up at night. Our online presence should be the first numbers that we check out weekly instead of our social media friends list. Our empty pews should make us uncomfortable. Even in the midst of our current situation and our social distancing, we can still be who God has called us to be. We can still answer the call that God has placed on our lives. You see, God's desire is that every space be filled in his house. Every space of worship be filled regardless of where that worship is taking place. You see, there are people in our alleys and our streets that God has on his mind and his heart that he cares deeply, so deeply about. And he has placed the invitation into our hands that there is still room. Verse 23 says, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come so that my house will be full. If we are going to live a life of greatness and step into who God created us to be, then we must have a posture to compel. As disciples, it is not about us. It's always about others. Go and compel them to come. This is what Jesus wants for your life and for my life. We should live such a compelling life that it is so magnetic that others are drawn to the only person who gives life. 
our everyday lives should be a breeding place of joy that when people see us, regardless of their circumstances, they feel joy. Remember, we are the church, not this building. We are the church, not the parking lot. We may not be physically together right now, but we are still all spiritually connected to the creator of the universe, and we are called to a posture of Jesus. We're called to a posture of Jesus where we wrap the towel around our waist and we go out to the road and we wash and we serve and we love and we compel. We compel people not to come to the building, but come to the rock. We wrap the towel around our waist and we go to the country lanes and we wash and we serve and we love and we compel people to come not to the parking lot, but to the one who gave us life, the one who gave his life as a ransom for all. You see, the path of greatness is never at the top. It's always at the lowest place. And when you and I find ourselves and we take our position in the lowest place, we commit our lives to a posture of humility. We commit our lives to a posture to serve. We commit our lives to a posture to love. We commit our lives to a posture to compel. I would not be here today if it were not for those people who chose to be humble and wash my nasty feet. I would not be here today if it were not for those people who chose to serve me in my greatest hour of need. I would not be here today if it were not for those people who chose to love me when I felt that I was unlovable. I would not be here today if it were not for those people who chose to compel me to come because there was still room in God's house. Jesus came and he showed us what it was like to reclaim our humanity, our community our nation, and our world desperately need to see the posture of Jesus. Will you take these and show it to them? When we take on the posture of Jesus, people find healing. They find love. They find freedom. They find a place to belong. And they find that there is still room at the supper table. Would you please now join me as we enter into communion? Oh God, how our hearts yearn to come before you together in your sanctuary. Our choir and our praise band desire to sing and lead the congregation in hymns and songs of praise. We long for the day when we might once again pass your peace, greet one another with a holy kiss, and extend the hand of fellowship to our neighbor. Our time away from your sanctuary feels like a great sacrifice. Sometimes it feels too much for us to bear, yet we offer it up to you as an act of holy worship. Sanctify our separation as we seek to end this plague upon our community. Use this act of love and grace that we extend to each other for our safety. May it be to you as a song of praise and gratitude for the community of souls that we hold so dear. In this silence, let us hear more clearly your intimate voice. In this solitude, let us feel the assurance that we are always held in your strong embrace. May we remember with gratitude our baptism each time we wash our hands. May we remember with thanksgiving your breath of life whenever we wear our masks. May we celebrate our community with each telephone call that we share, and may we rejoice each time we hear each other's voice. During this time, your praises have not been silenced. They are still heard on earth and in heaven 
as all those around your throne are continually singing even to this day, holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Even while we are apart, we still remember that in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus. The fullness of time was not a perfect and sweet time. The fullness of time was a time of danger. It was a time of exile. It too was a time of unknown. The fullness of time was filled with hope and trust. It was a trust in your great promises to be fulfilled in the life of a baby. And those promises took time to develop, but would mature, grow, and become the savior of the world in due time. We do not always understand what you are doing. You try to wash our feet, but we feel unworthy. You try to explain that the servant of all is the person we are to emulate. You try to help us understand that all we need to do is love, but we still struggle to understand. Even now, during this time of social isolation, we remember how during his last Passover celebration that Jesus took the bread to remind us of all who of those that are still struggling under oppression. We remember Christ's joyful prayer of thanksgiving. We remember how Jesus broke the bread and shared it to include everyone. We remember it being said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. We remember how we recalled Christ's acts and words every time we ate the bread at his table. And we are grateful. Even now, during this time of social isolation, we remember how after his last Passover meal, Jesus took the cup of wine used to remember the hope we hold in our hearts for deliverance. We remember Christ's joyful prayer of thanksgiving. We remember how Jesus passed the cup and shared it to include everyone. We remember it being said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of God's covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. We remember how we have recalled Christ's acts and words every time we drank from his cup. And we are grateful. It is important that we remember. As important as it is the sacrament that we partake in that we remember what Christ has done. It is what Christ has done through his sacrifice that has not only changed our lives, but has redeemed the world. It is this holy mystery that makes us all the difference, even during this time of separation. And we believe the holy mystery, that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, that Christ will come again. Almighty God, we ask that your spirit would fall upon these gifts and fall upon all of us together. Make these gifts be for us, the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Amen. Now I ask you to join me as you take whatever it is that you have representing Christ's body, whatever it is that you have representing Christ's blood, And if you don't have either one of these, it's fine. Join us in that sweet, sweet spirit and essence of Christ. Take, eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. This is my blood. The blood of the new covenant. Covenant shared for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Please join me in prayer. Almighty and ever gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for being that picture, that perfect picture of humility of service, of love. And we thank you for leading such a compelling life. 
that was always an invitation, that is still the invitation, and always will be the invitation to come. Because there's still room at the table. There's still room in your house. We pray all this in your most precious and holy name. Amen. I love you. Go and enjoy your beautiful day in Christ's love. We invite you to join us in our closing song, Testify to Love. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And I'd like to add, and let's do it louder than ever before, but still with humility. to testify to your love, Lord. Thank you for giving us the stories that we can share of how you have transformed our lives as we walk on our journey with you. And we pray this in the powerful, changing name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today again. We love you and miss you and look forward to seeing you live and in person. But until then, just be blessed and share your story 
of what God's done for you in your life. And do it louder than before. In Jesus' name, amen.